do belatedly tonight is share with you one of my favorite all-time newspaper headlines. Lots of physicists are nervous about the speed of light. Now, what does this even mean? Number one, what should I be nervous about the speed of light? This is something we understood now for more than 100 years, suspected a lot about for centuries before that. And number two, who are these lots of physicists? I know lots of physicists, and I don't know a single one who's at all nervous about the speed of light. Well, this was a headline unfortunately published by The Atlantic back in 2011 at the height of the so-called faster-than-light neutrino controversy, in which an experiment with a Large Hadron Collider, that giant particle accelerator buried underneath the border of France and Switzerland, detected these subatomic particles called neutrinos that were supposedly traveling faster than the speed of light, the cosmic speed limit. This was pretty bad news. But the researchers were so sure about the speed of light that when they published their paper about this, they didn't say, we discovered neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. They said, help us find our mistake. And a few months later, after exhaustively searching the miles-long experiment, they discovered a single Ethernet cable that was faulty, something that we can sympathize with tonight. <laughs> and after they replaced that one Ethernet cable, neutrinos were no longer traveling faster than the speed of light. <laughs> but we were still left with hundreds of headlines like this one. It's also pretty easy to find headlines like this. Asteroid on Earth collision course. Now, the implication here is really clear. This is a huge asteroid, and when it hits the Earth, it's going to do lots of damage. But it hides the fact that asteroids actually hit the Earth every single day. And each one of you has probably seen at least one hit the Earth. Because every time you look up and you see a shooting star, you're seeing a little rock from space smack into the Earth's atmosphere and go out in a blaze of glory. But it's a cheap and easy headline. But the kind of headline that I'd like to complain about tonight uh, are headlines like this that suggest that some tiny new discovery has completely changed everything we know about some aspect of the universe. In this case, giant black holes have totally upended what we know about the evolution of the universe. In this case, somehow pancakes have messed with our understanding of how galaxies are formed. And distilling this down to its utmost, opposite orbits upend theories. Whatever that means. <laughs> but the point here is pretty clear. It's that our whole foundation of knowledge about science is every day teetering on a knife's edge, just waiting for that one little discovery that's going to be destruction to everything that we think we know. And I don't like that. So I'd like to propose something else tonight. I'd like to propose that learning more doesn't mean you were stupid before. And in an effort to illustrate this, I went to the world headquarters of stupidity. Yahoo Answers. <laughs> and it didn't take long searching the physics and astronomy section of Yahoo Answers, a very depressing thing, uh, by the way, to find one of the more burning questions available online. Is the Earth flat? <laughs> And 16 people responded with varying degrees of certainty about the flatness and or roundness of the Earth. And because of what I'm about to say, and because I know this will one day end up on the internet, hello, internet people. The Earth is not flat. It's never been flat, and I very much hope it never will be flat. <laughs> but what I'd like to suggest tonight is that there was a time and there was a place in which thinking the Earth was flat was not a ridiculous idea. For example, if you lived, say, 10,000 years ago, in a place like this, thinking the Earth was flat, that was a huge intellectual leap. And it showed that you understood a very important principle about the Earth, which is that the sort of short distance geography of the Earth doesn't explain the long, large scale structure that we see of the planet. If you lived in Rocky Mountain National Park, to you, effectively, the Earth was flat. And that solved all the problems that you needed to have solved. But how accurate 
was that guess. And to understand that, basically we're comparing this nice curved surface of the Earth here in blue against the purported flatness of the Earth here in red. If you break out your ruler and you draw some triangles and find your calculator and punch in some numbers, what you find is the Earth deviates from flat by eight inches for every mile. One part in 10,000. And so if you were part of a group of people who didn't travel that far, or you lacked the measurement capability to measure one part in 10,000, then to you, effectively, the Earth was flat. And that matched all the observations you were able to make in your entire life. But that doesn't mean there wasn't evidence of the roundness of the Earth all around us. And lost to history is the first person to realize that the Earth probably wasn't flat and how they figured that out. But we can take a guess about how that might have worked. And one of the easiest ways to realize that the Earth isn't flat is to look up at the night sky and take in the constellations. Because if you looked up and you saw the constellations here in Boulder, and you took some time and memorized them, if you didn't have Netflix, cats, you have plenty of time for constellation memorization. And then you jumped into your Paleolithic car and drove down towards the equator, you would notice rising above the horizon new constellations you had never seen before. If you then turned that car around and drove towards the pole, you'd see those familiar constellations begin to disappear themselves beneath the horizon. And if you had some basic understanding of geometry, as was developed thousands of years ago in places like Egypt, or India, or Babylon, you would have figured out that a curved surface was a very sensible explanation for why you could sometimes see things in the night sky and sometimes not. And once you've made that leap, you could start to think about things like how big is the Earth? And again, we don't know the first person who thought about this question, who answered this question because those records have been lost to us. But we do know the first person who did a careful measurement of this and had their records survive to the present day. And that was a Greek thinker named Eratosthenes. And what Eratosthenes did was listen to the rumor mill, because he had heard that in a town south of his, on the summer solstice, the sun was directly overhead. And he knew that on the very same day in his town, the sun wasn't directly overhead. So he paid a guy to walk between those two towns and measure their distance. And then knowing that, plus the angle that the sun deviated from right up above, he was able to estimate the circumference or the distance around the Earth. And he gave us this measurement, 250,000 stadia. Now, what does that mean? And it turns out that our ability to understand the accuracy of Eratosthenes' measurement is most constrained by the fact that we don't know what a stadia is. <laughs> this is the fundamental unit of Greek and Roman culture, and yet various sources give its distance as anywhere from 140 to 200 meters. But if you find a particularly well-researched source, we can go with something like 158 meters per stadia. Times that by 250,000 stadia, and we get a diameter for the Earth, circumference for the Earth, of 39,500 kilometers. The Earth was a big place. And we can compare that to our modern day measurement of 39,941 kilometers. If you break that calculator out again, you punch some numbers in, we find Eratosthenes was off by just 1.1%, 2,200 years ago. And for nearly two millennia, this was our basic picture of the size and the shape of the Earth. But eventually we realized that the Earth isn't actually a perfect sphere. Because it's spinning, the equator bulges out and the poles get squished down. And if you measure the diameter of the Earth at the equator, you get a number that's about 40 kilometers larger than if you measure the diameter of the Earth from pole to pole. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that every time we discover something new about the universe, it doesn't invalidate everything that we learned previously. It simply changes the region over which that understanding was acceptable. So for example, if you're organizing a 100 meter dash, you don't have to worry about your competitors disappearing over the horizon. <laughs> For the size of a stadium, the Earth is effectively flat, and we can work with that. 
And if you're building the world's largest t-shirt cannon to bombard the good folks of Montana with t-shirts, you don't have to worry about the fact that the Earth isn't a sphere, because your t-shirts are still going to get there. <laughs> but if we're making GPS measurements or satellite observations of the Earth, then we have to take into account the fact that the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, and that we know more now. But because we have a detailed understanding of the shape of the Earth today, doesn't invalidate the work of those who realized that the Earth wasn't a sphere. It's not. And that work didn't invalidate the fact that Eratosthenes realized that the Earth isn't flat, but actually basically round. And his work didn't invalidate the fact that over short distances, we can consider the Earth to basically be flat. And so next time you see a headline like this, I hope you think a little bit and realize that probably everything we know about the universe isn't completely wrong. Instead, it's much more likely that some little part of it isn't quite right. Thank you.